Welcome to the Sports Science Dudes. I am your host, Dr. Jose Antonio, with my co-host, Dr. Tony Ricci. If you're a first-time listener, hit the subscribe button and like the show. You can find us on YouTube, Rumble, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Uh, our special guest today is Dr. Dominic Diagostino. He got his PhD in, I believe it's both physiology and neuroscience from the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. That was back in 2004. Yeah, BS in bi uh, biology and nutrition science at Rutgers. That was back in 1998. Uh, he's currently a researcher and professor. He has quite a diverse background in neuroscience. Uh, molecular Pharmacology, Nutrition, and Physiology. Uh, you're also a tenured associate prof in, de in the Department of Molecular Pharmacology and Physiology at the University of South Florida, right. Morsani College of Medicine. That is in Tampa, correct? That's Tampa, right? Yep, Tampa. Okay. Yeah, uh, I love Tampa. Tampa is a beautiful place. Um, you've also been awarded many, many grants that have resulted in national and international research collaborations and publications in such... Uh, peer-reviewed publications such as JAP, I love that journal, uh, Cell Metabolism, Neuroscience, Carcinogenesis, that's a journal I'll never be in, Tony, uh, <laughs> Nature Medicine, Journal of Neurophys, and the Journal of Microscopy, so some heavy-hitting journals there. That's now, impressive. what you're most known for is work on, certainly, when you sort of leave the realm of just basic science, people know uh, the ketogenic diet stuff uh, that you've done. So, yeah. First of all, I want to welcome you to the Sports Science Dudes. Thanks, Dom, for taking time out of your day. I know you have you have cows in the background, you know, mooing and stuff. So, so you're the first guest that has like cows in your backyard. I, I uh -huh. alligators too. I have a, a a six acre lake. We have a fish farm too. And there's some alligators, but it's a little too cold for alligators today. But oh, a lot of times good. I see them from my my office, and sometimes I do a stand up paddle boarding. I think you do that too, right? Yeah, I race. Yeah, yeah. Oh, really? You race? Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 So you paddle where, where the alligators are. I do. Yeah. Like one time, you know, a couple of times I'll have the little ones come up to me and I got to like push their head down, push them away <laughs> with the paddle. They're, yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, I, I live right off the St. Lucie River. We I do quite a bit of paddling uh, there. Mm -hmm. Alligators, for the most part, they when you approach them, they sort of just bugger off. They are not really aggressive. Yeah. I mean, they're not like crocodiles. Oh. No, yeah, we, we we had a very big one that was aggressive, but oh. uh, we we got we had him for dinner. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, okay. and my my dogs too. So I got to protect. I got two big oh, dogs. Yeah. Uh, they got into a fight with an alligator two months ago to three months ago. And long story short, but the dogs had the alligator for breakfast. I'll say. Ah, so, uh, <laughs> okay. So, so it wasn't ate, a large one. At least it was a uh, sort of one of the smaller gators. Well, when you hold it up, it measures just under five feet, but well, you that's, know, that's a but good with size. A tail and everything. Yeah. But it was, wow. you pick them up, it was like 25 pounds or something. Like that. It wasn't <laughs> like the 10, 10 footer that we had, which I needed my tractor, you know, to get that one. So, yeah. yeah. 10 footer, that'll take an adult human and do a little death roll and, or you know what, you're swallowing yeah. water. So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, we can talk all day about alligators because I'm always yeah. looking for them. But, anyways. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, let's, let's, uh, I want to talk the analogy of high protein and also the ketogenic diets. When you ask a hundred people who do work in nutrition, what a high protein diet is, oftentimes there's, there's, there's no agreement at all. In fact, I probably define high protein higher than most people. Um, but in the literature, you'll see high protein is anything higher than ERDA, anything more than 1.2 grams per kilo even defined as, you know, if it's 35% of your diet, which I don't like percentages, because if you're eating a low calorie diet, I mean, 35% of your diet is nothing. So does that exist within the ketogenic, within ketogenic diets in terms of definitions that there's no agreement or is there a universal agreement? Yeah. I'm glad you bring that up. Cause that's like one of the biggest areas of contention, you know, the early ketogenic diets, the medical ones were like four to one ratio, four parts fat in grams, not in like uh, percentages, four parts fat, one part protein. Uh, and if you work out the math, it's like, you know, something like 0.6 to 0.8 grams per kilogram. It's pretty low. Uh, of protein. Of protein. Of protein. Yeah. So, wow. and you know, these early studies in pediatric epilepsy showed stunting of growth and that you know there's some side effects i think associated with the low protein 
Protein is slightly insulinogenic, so it could decrease your ketone levels. Uh, but over the years, the, the levels of protein have been uh, used higher in, in more clinical ketogenic diets. We call it, it goes like four to one, two to one, three to one, two to one, 1 1.5 to one, which is also called the modified Atkins diet. Right. And that's the diet actually used in, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, you'll find uh, hundreds of clinical trials right now with the ketogenic diet. And they're using a high, a higher protein diet. It's still, it's not like, I guess it would fit like 1.2 grams per kilogram. So it's right on the edge of that, you know, one to one, one study is like 1.6 grams per kilogram, which I think is more appropriate for especially, you know, depending upon the population. So is there a cutoff that you personally would say, Hey, that's a little too much protein and it's no longer ketogenic. Uh, I'm if for athletes, I think 1.8 to even some athletes, two grams per kilogram is fine. And I think that's good. Uh, for medical as a medical therapy, I think 1.2 to 1.6, which is by all clinicians standpoint, is pretty, high, pretty high. If you talk to a neurologist who uses the diet for epilepsy is high, but I, but I think that's most appropriate. I think what we don't want is a protein deficient diet. Right. That right. We know historically, even in the literature, they point to it and there's various issues, you know, with kids growth and things like that. And that's all attributed. It wasn't, um, it's almost like, like there, there was not an understanding of protein metabolism, the knowledge of the, you know, that they, they were not up on nutrition enough to understand that the side effects were associated with too much protein restriction. So right. it's super important, especially in a growing child and especially in the age population too. Uh, age-related sarcopenia is so important. So historically, when was the ketogenic diet first introduced? And, and I guess, you know, I'm always curious as to the first person to try it. Like, what's the thought process? Mm -hmm. Hey, let's give this child a, a super high fat diet. I, you know, when did that happen? And who was that person? Yeah, the Mayo Clinic, there was a couple, uh, well, I guess you can go back a little bit farther with like banting and using uh, a low, they didn't call it at the time, but basically like a ketogenic diet to keep type one diabetes patients alive because uh, that was actually used, but prior to the ad prior to insulin being, you know, um, developed. Uh, but, you know, I think generally speaking, the ketogenic diet was developed at Mayo Clinic uh, by a couple of investigators working on it. Wilder comes up as a name that he, he did a, a short uh, clinical bulletin on this and just showed that, it was highly efficacious for treating epilepsy, all different forms of epilepsy, even independent sort of of the etiology of epilepsy. And they didn't really know, you know, what was causing different forms of epilepsy back then. But so 1920, 1921. So we have over a hundred oh. years clinical use of a ketogenic diet in the literature. And, and if I can ask, um, in its origins, what would what would those well, if not percentages, ratios or or even grams have been? Was it closer to some of the earlier, you know, eighty five percent fat and the crazy mm -hmm. numbers that we heard? Well, not, I shouldn't say that we heard, but some people did apply, you know, eighty five percent fat, uh, ten percent protein max, and five percent carbohydrate. In its origins, is that closer to where it was, or? Yeah. So what they tried to do, the idea was at the time to mimic the physiological state of fasting. We, they knew, we knew millennia that fasting was uh, a cure, you know, for seizures. So, you know, this was written about by Hippocrates. It's, you know, in book of Matthew, it's in the Bible. I mean, it's, it was all over throughout history that fasting was a way to manage seizures. So uh, when subjects fasted, they saw that it can control seizures. And when they drew blood, they saw these ketone bodies forming in the blood and the urine, also in the breath. So the idea then was to develop a, a diet that was eucaloric, that could sustain life and had the minimal amount of protein. And that was about eight to 10% back then with a majority of basically just feed fat. This would, uh, and if you drew blood from someone who was eating this diet and you adjusted calories to be uh, a calorie deficit or even eucaloric, their blood looked like they were fasting. 
meaning that glucose was low, insulin was low, and uh, the ketone bodies were elevated, similar to fasting. Wow. And so the ketone is- bodies, changing your metabolic physiology changes your brain energy. It also mm-hmm. changes the neuropharmacology of your brain in many different ways that we study, actually. And this has an anti-seizure effect. They didn't know it back then because they didn't even know that the brain could use ketones as a source of energy, right. but they just knew that this this elevation of ketones in the blood produced this remarkable effect. So if it has such a powerful effect on the on the central nervous system, if if just any random person who's somewhat healthy embarks on a ketogenic diet, I know I've tried it, but mm-hmm. I like rice too much. So there's <laughs> no way I could yeah. there's no way I can ad- adhere to it. But what are the cognitive effects of it for someone who normally eats a mixed diet, you know, carbs, fat, protein, and, you know, switches over. What's the data show in terms of, you know, the effects on the brain? Yeah, good question. Um, so ketogenic diets and what we call therapeutic ketosis, because there are many ways to achieve that, tend to have a beneficial effect in the context of an energy deficit in the brain or a disrupted brain homeostasis or disrupted neurotransmitter systems in the brain. However, if you take normal healthy subjects and do a brain scan on them like an fmri and then just look at you know uh, cognitive function and look at brain neural circuitry you'll see some some changes that happen uh, in regards to like network connectivity and uh and this is you know you get more of a beneficial effect as the person ages because there's age-related cognitive decline that may not be pathological yet that you start to see some benefits. As we age, the brain's ability to use glucose as a fuel decreases with age. uh, And that's due to a number of different reasons. There's some vascular components. There's, you know, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, the GLUT1 transporter, the GLUT3 transporter, which is on uh, neurons. However, our, the brain's ability to use ketones as an energy source, as we brain, as we age is sustained. And that does Hmm. not decrease with age. So, so you have that. Um, so the brain will use ketones if it's in the blood, meaning that um, if your blood ketone levels are elevated one millimolar, which you'd get with like a, a, you know, a moderate ketogenic diet, that would give the brain about a 10% boost in available energy. So that's from a millimolar perspective. So 10, 20 mil, for example, George Cahill at Harvard Medical School with Oliver Owen fasted subjects for 40 days, believe it or not. (laughs) This is research that's really caught my attention when I started doing, you know, research. Wait, when you say fasted, they just consumed water. Yeah, water. And I think they took uh, maybe small amounts of electrolytes too. So yeah, so yeah, you can't, no IRB would approve this nowadays, but I always reference it in my talk. Uh, And after seven to 10 days, uh, the ketone levels in the blood were elevated to about five millimolar. Glucose went down. The, The homeostatic mechanisms that maintain blood glucose are very powerful. So your glucose is never going to go to zero. So it'll drop down to like maybe two to three millimolar and then stay there but the ketones will be like double that. That'll be like five to six millimolar. So uh, the brain will basically can freely use those energy sources as for fuel. So after about a week of fasting, two thirds of brain energy metabolism is derived from ketone bodies. So that's really important in the context of if we did not make ketone bodies, uh, we would rapidly succumb to muscle wasting during a fasting state because we would break down body fat and uh, we would liberate fatty acids for fuel and your heart and your skeletal muscles use fatty acids for fuel. But these long chain fats do not cross the blood brain barrier. So they go to the liver and through beta oxidation of fatty acids uh, creates acetyl-CoA and then acetoacetate and then beta hydroxybutyrate, which is the main ketone in circulation. So uh, these ketone bodies restore and maintain brain energy metabolism in the face of fasting and also in the face of carbohydrate restriction or zero carbohydrates. We technically don't need them because you could follow a ketogenic diet and then the ketones largely replace 
glucose as the primary fuel for the brain. So this is a long-winded answer to your question, but uh, <laughs> so in the context of a normal, healthy person, the benefits from that would be like, I've been on a mild, moderate ketogenic diet for 15 years. And for me, like I started it when I transitioned to a tenure track position and I noticed that I did not get hungry and I had sustained energy and my fluctuations in energy were reduced. It was in some way kind of liberating because I followed like the low fat, high protein diet, eating rice and tuna fish and things like that. And then I would get hungry two or three hours later on a ketogenic diet. I could eat breakfast and not get hungry until dinner. And then I could be working all day and not, not get hungry. So well, there's a logistical is, advantage to that. <laughs> well, this is interesting because, uh, you're doing what you do research on. I mean, personally, it's yeah. part of your diet. Describe what you're eating, though, because I'm always curious that there. I have met very few people who have adhered to a ketogenic diet for any length of period of time. They've done it maybe for four weeks or eight weeks or whatnot. So describe your typical day, if there is such a typical day, what you eat, because I've always been, you know, not surprised, but there's a limitation on the foods you can eat. And I think, you know, a lot of the foods I eat are carbohydrates, you know, mm -hmm. like rice, pasta, fruits yeah. and vegetables. I would imagine you're somewhat limited. So tell us what, you know, what you typically eat in a day. Yeah. I, I always like to like, tell me what you buy at the grocery store. So uh, I have a chest freezer that has like about 300 pounds of meat in it <laughs> and it's, it's hooked up to my solar. So if power goes out. I still have, I still have it uh, hooked up. Um, so, uh, you know, beef, pork, chicken, I eat a lot of turkey, uh, a lot of eggs, uh, a lot of fish, you know, that could be from shrimp, uh, salmon, I eat a ton of mackerel and sardines. Um, I eat as far as like vegetables, I eat wild blueberries every day, we have avocado trees on the farm here. So a lot of avocados, uh, I eat usually like one small apple per day. So apple, blueberries, and broccoli, I eat every single day. And that makes up about maybe 50 grams of carbs with about a third of that being fiber. Mm -hmm. And I do, I'm of the opinion, unlike a lot of people on keto or low carb, that fiber, I think fiber is important, not only for the microbiome, but you know, it helps. Uh, there's many different aspects of eating plants that the phytonutrients, the polyphenols, the fiber, all these things are beneficial in my opinion. Uh, so like for breakfast today, I had steak and eggs, which I frequently have. Uh, and for lunch, I had, uh, I had sardines or mackerel, canned sardines or mackerel and some turkey uh, that I had like a turkey leg. And uh, for, for dinner, I think we're going to cook up fish. And I usually have my carbohydrates later in the day. Like I'll have have either a salad or broccoli asparagus and then at night time i mix i make this like chocolate keto mousse that i put like blueberries in and some collagen powder with mct kind of combined chocolate powder <laughs> that i mix together and uh it almost sounds is, like i've always done this even when i was like yeah. in college i would take metrics i don't know if you remember metrics. yeah well, i remember metrics. metrics with hmb i had i bought like <laughs> i bought i bought it the whole lot of it or whatever and then i would put like two packets of metrics with hmb in a bowl then i'd put water in it and then i would stir it so it was like uh like a pudding and i would eat that like every night sometimes i cut a banana in it and like every day i'd come home from the lab working like doing my rat studies at like midnight eating watching like uh conan o'brien or something or, or leno like every night that was my routine leno. we're going way back <laughs> yeah yeah way back <laughs> no don you know it's funny the reason i moved to florida is actually to work at metrics they had an office oh, in really? Boca yeah they had an wow. office in boca raton it, uh, it was actually jeff stout who got me the job he was yeah. working down here as well so uh so oh, i'm yeah, quite yeah. familiar with the metrics white box and their protein powder and whatnot mm -hmm. but i think it's a dead brand now i don't know anyone who even knows metrics i don't I I, you know a, I use it in bars football. Out, right? Yeah, they yeah, have. A few I think people. they have some bars. Yep. Yeah. When I played high school football, I forgot how I got, but it it came in base and plus, <laughs> and I would mix it together, yeah. and I would mix it together, and I would put a scoop of another product called Cytomax that had alpha L polylactate in it. Yep. I did it because I was into mountain bike racing, 
And that was like my football fuel. And, uh, and at the time, I don't know, they don't still sell it. I took like ephedrine, caffeine, aspirin stack. I mean, yeah. like, I mean, basically what I just described there, like there's no, oh, creatine too. I was like one of the first people to use creatine. This goes back to 1992. So I was using creatine monohydrate. Yeah. And, you know, fast forward like 30 some years later, 40 years later, and like, there's like no innovation. I mean, like there's nothing better than like caffeine, creatine, right. maybe beta alanine or something like that. But uh, ketones, I think, I mean, I study ketones, so we can, we can talk about that. So I think there's some beneficial effects of ketones too. Well, yeah, talk about, um, at least in the exercise space, I'm starting to see, and you would know this a lot better than me, a lot of studies on exogenous ketone uh, supplementation. Yes. Um, the data is mixed. So explain, yeah. you know, because I'm not super familiar with the data. I, I read some of the ones that, that talk about whether performance goes up, performance goes down, performance doesn't change. Tell the audience a little bit about the exogenous ketone uh, ester supplementation studies. Yeah, and then there's ketone salts too. Actually, that's kind of what I'm drinking here. Oh, <laughs> okay. Electrolytes. So, uh, and it's not, people think of salt, they think of like sodium chloride, but uh, well, I'll kind of take a step back. So you add the ketogenic diet that can achieve ketosis and the key the ketogenic diet is very unique in that it's defined by an objective biomarker that's the elevation of blood urine or breath ketones right mm -hmm. you can also achieve that through fasting so there's dietary ketosis and then there's um there's some drugs that can induce ketosis but i won't i won't go there and then there's you know different forms of the ketogenic diet that can produce therapeutic ketosis and then there are uh there are calorie containing substances that can increase ketone bodies in the blood. So the, this is in the form of one would actually be MCT, medium chain triglyceride. So that's, and then in, independent of carbohydrate intake, you can consume MCT. Perillo was selling this back in like 1980s, in 1990, yeah, John Perillo. Well, I remember. So <laughs> cap tree, cap tree. And it's like, you know, I guess maybe I used that too back in the day. But uh, so you have MCT, that's like the poor man's ketone ester, I guess. And then, so ketogenic fat. And then you have, uh, you have 1,3-butane diol, which is being sold as a ketone ester. So that's a dialcohol or a glycol molecule. When you consume it, 1,3-butane diol is broken down. It does produce a slightly toxic aldehyde. And then it also liberates beta hydroxybutyrate. Uh, low levels, maybe you know, low to moderate, like one millimolar, maybe two. Uh, but then it gives you a buzz because it's an alcohol. So basically, the stuff that's on the market now is they're selling cheap one three butane dial, <laughs> and they're selling it as a ketone ester, but it's actually not. Uh, there are a couple ketone esters on the market, Delta G ketone aid, and I think. However, the backbone of a ketone ester is one three butane dial. And then you do a trans esterification reaction, then you can add beta hydroxybutyrate to 13 butane diol. So when you consume it, the beta hydroxybutyrate quickly goes up into circulation. And if you do a pharmacokinetic profile, you see a first like initial spike. And then the 13 butane diol gets broken down in the liver, and then that releases beta hydroxybutyrate a little bit slower. But the whole, like on an empty stomach, your ketones go up and they come down, and they're kind of out of your circulation within like two or three hours, depending upon the dose. So now you can have a 1,3-butane diol beta-hydroxybutyrate monoester. You could have a diester of acetoacetate, which will elevate both ketones, beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. We've done a lot of work with that molecule. It's very effective. Uh, and then you can have glycerol, and then you can make a triester of glycerol, a triester beta-hydroxybutyrate or acetoacetate. So the other, the last form of ketones I'll talk about is essentially taking a monovalent or a divalent cation. That's a fancy word for sodium, <laughs> potassium, calcium, magnesium. You could theoretically take certain amino acids that are alkaline like uh, arginine or citrulline or histidine or things like that. Uh, lithium you could also use as a cation. So the ones that are on the market are basically taking these balanced electrolyte preparation like sodium and calcium especially and magnesium and potassium too. And then you spread out the beta hydroxybutyrate across different uh, electrolytes. So when you consume the product, it's like consuming an electrolyte product, but it's 
giving your body ketones. Mm -hmm. So there's a product on the market I love. It's called Element, L-M-N-T. And that's like a, Rob Wolf has it. It's a supplement. You know, it's, you know, they use it big in CrossFit. I think the military uses it. Uh, the product that I'm drinking now, uh, Keto Star, is, has the same electrolytes as Element, but instead of like sodium chloride, it's sodium beta-hydroxybutyrate. And then it's like, you know, potassium, magnesium, calcium. So you consume it, gives your body electrolytes, which tend to be depleted on ketogenic diets. And I could mm -hmm. go into why. Has a naturetic and a diuretic effect, but it's also giving your body a source of energy. The two, form, basically the two or three forms of energy that your brain can use, right? Glucose being the primary ketones. Your brain can also use lactate. Right. Yeah. So that's the ketone salt. And I think there are many benefits. The salts will get you into that one to two millimolar range. Now, a ketone ester can get you to three, four, and five millimolar, and everybody thinks more is better, but it's it's almost like blood glucose, like higher blood glucose is not better, right? So you actually can create a situation where there's an energy tox toxicity. By consuming a large dose of a ketone ester, your ketones get really high. That can actually change your blood pH, which we have shown in the lab, and I mean, in rodent models, we've when we first started using these compounds, we started, you know, taking out rodents because the dosage was too high that they would succumb to ketoacidosis. So the ketone esters are really, are really are pretty potent and you have to consume a lot of them. Uh, but I think, I think the message that I try to get across experimentally, we see this too, is higher is not better. Higher ketones can actually impair performance. It's like your body's trying to get rid of that metabolic acidosis and you have energy toxicity. However, with that said, we study very extreme environments and <laughs> we study like very high pressure oxygen toxicity, you know, hypoxia and these extreme environments where a ketone ester could be favorable over a ketone salt. But I think for 90 plus percent of the applications where you'll get a benefit of a ketone product, I think a ketone salt. Uh, a ketone electrolyte would would uh, would work, but dosage, timing. I mean, there's so many unanswered questions, and it's a very nascent field. Yeah. So actually, I was going to ask you about the dosing issue. It, yeah. I, I mean, for pretty much any type of supplement, caffeine, creates and beta alanine. We know the dosing. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what would it be? In fact, before you know, I had, we had you on the podcast. I just looked up random ketone ester products online and. Mm -hmm. There's like a bazillion of them. <laughs> it's oh, it's wow, it's, yeah, it's its own category. So yeah. if you could tell the audience, if you were to look at this category, how would you determine whether one is dosed correctly? Yeah, so good question. Um, so higher is not better. <laughs> so I'll say that, uh, you know, even in the context of like stuff that we study like cancer, I mean, we could get cancer cells to grow faster if your ketones get higher. Uh, there are, the ketones are very interesting in that they're, they are metabolite, but they have epigenetic effects. They have signaling effects. So, and they can also have, when your ketone levels acutely get above two millimolar, that stimulates a release of insulin. And a very prominent feature of exogenous ketones is that it lowers blood glucose. Um, and that is due to a number of different reasons, enhancement of insulin sensitivity. That's what some of the marketers will tell you. But, uh, but if you take a large dose acutely of ketones, that that's how our body regulates ketosis, right? So we get onto a ketogenic diet, our ketones get elevated. There's ketone urea, we excrete some ketones, but then the ketones will stimulate the pancreas to release a little bit of insulin. And that will decrease beta oxidation of fatty acids in the liver. And that's the counter regulation. That's how we, that's how we, in a very uh, elegant way, that's how we uh, get our endogenous ketone production optimized, I guess you could say. Uh, so when it comes to dosing of ketones, I would say I wouldn't go any higher than 10 grams of beta hydroxybutyrate. So, uh, you know, most of the ketone salt products like have two grand, like it's fairy dusted. I think that's one of, you know, they have low. And then the one three butane diol is not technically beta hydroxybutyrate, but I think if you take about maybe 20 grams of one three butane diol, that might be equivalent to like 10 grams. No, maybe 30, 20 to 30 grams of 
1,3-butane diol, which is what you'll see advertised, would be about 10 grams of beta-hydroxybutyrate. Um, I have a product, the product that I use, uh, KetoStart, has 10 grams of beta-hydroxybutyrate salts, uh, excluding the electrolytes. So, and I just take a half of it. So my threshold for feeling something is about five grams. So I will take half of a dose, half of a packet, especially in the morning, it's got the electrolytes in it. It's got sodium and I'll mix it with uh, creatine monohydrate. So I mix that up and then I'll work for like two hours and then bam, like I'll feel it, you know, and it's not just a creatine, it's just and then the ketones tend to work very good with caffeine too. So I say the threshold dose would be about five grams, you know, and I think in regards to performance, cognitive performance, once you get about 10 to 20 grams is probably about the sweet spot. And that'll elevate your ketones about one to two millimolar. Uh, if you are using it for like extreme environments or sports or things like that, you could probably dose higher throughout an event you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 grams throughout the course of like a race or something like that would be appropriate. So let's, let's talk about uh, ex exercise performance. And, you know, I, I do a lot of stand up paddling. It's an endurance event. Um, races yeah. are anywhere from three miles to six miles. And there's a race around Key West. That's a 12 mile race. So it takes me a while to do it. So let's, let's take the endurance stuff and let's take the strength power stuff. What does the literature say in terms of the effects of let's let's deal with just exogenous ketone uh, ester supplementation? Yeah. So of all the things to study, <laughs> so if you look at PubMed and I guess if you go, if you look at PubMed, the rise of peer reviewed publications is something like in 2023, it was like 700 publications if you do ketogenic diet, but a lot of those are actually exogenous. Some of them are exogenous ketone studies. Okay. So, right. If you, if you look that up and then, uh, and there's a reason I'm going down this direction is just kind of put context into things. And then if you go to clinicaltrials.gov and you look at emerging like research or research that's being done now, uh, I think you have, I'm giving a talk on this soon. So, and I had some numbers, 504 studies, uh, as of February 11th, uh, if on clinic on ketogenic diet, if you search that term on uh, clinicaltrials.gov, registered uh, trials, and but if you dig into actually what's being studied, about a third of them, to even like 40% of them, are not ketogenic diet. They're actually ketone supplements. They're using okay. different like MCTs. Some of them are combining, and they're not mutually exclusive. You could do a diet, and I think it works well if you combine it with a ketone supplement. And there's, I think, in, in far, as far as exercise, maybe about, uh, out of like the 504 studies, like, I mean, I think there's like 40 studies on exercise. So the data is very, very mixed on that. As of right now, uh, probably because the aversive taste, probably because of uh, the dosing, uh, you know, studies, the tolerability of these things, the studies that have been done, the performance studies are giving exogenous ketones and then looking for an effect. They're just giving an acute dose mm -hmm. uh, and they're kind of shooting in the dark as to what would be the ideal dose based upon some earlier pharmacokinetic work. And then they do treadmill exercise, biking exercise, rowing, various uh, tasks, and then they look for an effect. So uh, I never thought, when I got into studying the ketogenic diet, I didn't even know of Jeff Bolick's work. So I just knew of the neuroscience, you know, the basic, and then I discovered like a year or two later, I was like, oh my God, someone's using, studying the ketogenic diet or ketones for performance. So that was like odd to yeah. me that it would even, people would go in that direction. Uh, so I think the advantage of being in ketosis during exercise is if you believe in the central governor theory, are you familiar mm -hmm. with that? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, you know, well, like your, your brain. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and this will tie into some of recent work that we did. Um, so basically preserving brain energy metabolism and fuel flow to the brain in the context of extreme exertion, right. You know, uh, and I think, or glycogen depletion, hypoglycemia induced by exercise. That's where I think, uh, ketosis can have, uh, an advantage in particular in the cognitive domain, reaction time, decision-making, okay. and uh, 
you know, we, we did a, we do a variety of different tests on that. So that's where, really where the benefits are going to come in when given acutely. The studies that have not been done that actually there's some on clinical trials that go that are doing it, is I think of ketones almost like a steroid, right? So there's like you give amphetamine or caffeine, then you get an effect. Whereas if you took like a dose of a steroid and then had them exercise, you're not going to see an effect. So ketones are really, in my opinion, a training aid. So therapeutic ketosis can enhance the adaptive response to exercise for a variety of different reasons that we can go into, you know, lower inflammation, there's epigenetic effects, there's, you know, effects on, on muscle, uh, anti-catabolic effects. So I think that no one has studied exogenous ketones yet in the context of a training aid, you know, over a period of even like a couple of weeks to, to months. So uh, now when given acutely, uh, I would say about 50% of the studies show like a small but significant effect. A, a quarter of the studies show like a negative effect. This usually has to do with like tolerability issues. Uh, like I said, if you get ketones too high, that can inhibit physiological processes. It puts a, a metabolic strain on the body, like an energy toxicity. And there's about maybe a quarter of the studies that just show like no effect at all in regards to performance. When, so, when you're talking about toxic, sorry, Tony, when you're talking about toxicity, how, how does that manifest clinically? What do you feel? Yeah. Uh, so, well, if it depends on the agent that you're consuming. So you could have like GI toxicity, which would be your, the ability, you know, these agents have, are pretty, pretty acidic. They can be pretty acidic when they're hydrolyzed in the gut. So that acidity can create what, what you, and I've probably consumed like, you know, I'm pretty, pretty confident that I've consumed more ketone esters than anybody else on the planet. So <laughs> we were I was testing these things like a long time ago when Patrick Arnold was making it like back oh, in wow. 2009 for me. So actually that's, he got me and he was able to synthesize some molecules <laughs> that got me started academically. So I'm very thankful wow. Patrick is known for other things in the world of, you know, performance enhancement, but he was actually the one that, that made the molecule that worked really well in our lab. Uh, so you have GI intolerability is part of the toxicity. Plus what happens is that the liver has to work pretty hard to break down the 1,3-butane diol. And then if your ketones spike up really high, especially with 1,3-butane diol, 1,3-butane diol by itself has a narcotic effect. So the NASA looked for like the ideal space food mm -hmm. and they, they looked at many different molecules. MIT did research looking at this and 1,3-butane diol made the top of the list. The only problem with it is that it had a mild narcotic effect. You got buzzed off of it. Some people like that, <laughs> uh, but it also has, it tastes like, it tastes like paint thinner, right? So oh, you God. have, <laughs> you have to mask the taste. It tastes really, really bad. Uh, Patrick and I found ways around that. Like you could make one, three butane diol jello shots. Like you could, you could, <laughs> there's different things that you could do. You can make jello out of it and just like slides down. So, uh, I don't think anyone's picked up on that, but I'm sure <laughs> someone will listen to this and come out with jello shots or one, three butane diol. Uh, Tony, you had a question. Yeah, no. Um, first the central governor goes way back to Angelo Moso, um, gosh, you're talking like 1890, La Fadica. I actually read that, which was yep. originally in Italian, and I had the translation. Wow. But, so my question, Dom, you mentioned something really cool. So it, it would make early sense, uh, you know, or initial sense, I should say, to see the potential benefit in more endurance activities, right? Where motor responses are relatively systematic, they're proactive versus reactive. Mm -hmm. uh, but ketone metabolism is, is, is a comparable rate then to glucose me, uh, metabolism and neuronal activity. And as a result of that, you so let's look at a complex cognitive processing. It's actually point. higher. It's higher. Sorry to interrupt, okay, great. It's a little so that's bit my higher. Question. Dr. Great. Richard Veach showed that, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's quicker then. Yeah, that's actually where Delta G comes from. The Delta G of ATP hydrolysis is about 25% higher with ketones versus like glucose molecule. Wow, so I think that's that actually okay. how the late Dr. Richard Veach, who was a, uh, a student of Hans Krebs, the Krebs site. So we're going yes. way back. He was actually like uh, a bit of a mentor to me, getting me into this field, uh, showed that the working heart preparation, the hydraulic efficiency of the heart 
uh, energetically could be increased by 25% if it was essentially burning ketones as an energy source relative to glucose. Fantastic. So whether that happens in the brain, no one has definitively sure, right? shown, but yeah. you know, it makes sense that it could. Okay. Yeah. That, and I was, I was asking for, you know, the best yeah. assertion based upon what we know. So hence a sport where rapid cognitive processing, and then you require that motor response that has to be coordinated, such as boxing, this Mm. ketones could benefit in that realm or arena as well then potentially yeah a lot of uh mma fighters a lot of uh, mixed martial arts guys ufc guys are using it many of them you know have contacted me and they they said you know these things are working i would be a little bit suspicious of something like one three butane dial because that has a narcotic effect that could actually slow you down whereas you'd probably want to use a a, a ketone electrolyte because these guys are sweating anyway. And uh, so you want to replenish the sodium, potassium, magnesium, things like that, and deliver okay, beta so hydroxybutyrate. Yeah, reaction time, psychomotor vigilance, uh, decision making, all these things are the things that are improved on ketosis. Fantastic. Not so much okay. physical performance, but yeah. Yeah, so BHB with a, an electrolyte would could be very mm-hmm. advantageous for the for the yeah. bouts, for the MMA. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Yep. Mix in some, you know, creatine with it, so maybe alpha GPC, a couple other things in it. But Great. yeah, I mean, that's kind of describing what I take. But yeah, awesome. Thanks. Yeah, Tony, this is. Uh, I mean, we do a lot of this stuff with Jamie Tartar over in neuroscience. Some of these simple measures. What would you recommend, like for someone who has never tried any of the any of these ketone exogenous ketone esters? What would be a good one to start when you're dealing with, let's say, subjects you want to do a pilot trial? Just to look at simple stuff like PVT and whatnot um, mm-hmm. that is tolerable to them that would have an acute effect. And if not an acute effect, maybe was it seven days or 14 days of supplementation? What would be a good one to try? Yeah, well, you might want to just try the so MCT will elevate your ketones too. So they've been around a long time. So I'll just kind of say that, you know, because people are like, well, I don't want to buy you know, a ketone supplement. Uh, However, the beta hydroxybutyrate is like, you know, a substance that your body makes anyway, and the electrolytes are something. However, the ketone esters do have 1,3-butane dial, and that's a synthetic molecule, you know, that essentially. So I would start with an electrolyte beta hydroxybutyrate product. Uh, Keto Start by Audacious Nutrition is pretty good. Uh, I think you can get it on Amazon. uh, And then like Amazon has their own brand. NutraCost or whatever. There's a couple different brands out there, but it's called Keto uh, Start. Keto, Keto Start. Start. So the advantage of that is that you can deliver up to 20 grams of beta hydroxybutyrate, and the electrolytes are balanced. That it doesn't give you GI issues, and then it, it it's really sweet because it's it uses monk fruit. Well, that's oh. another thing. It doesn't use like you know, some people have issues with artificial sweeteners, not so much me, but, you know, I think the jury's kind of still out on that in some domains like microbiome or, you know, stimulating hunger, things like that. But it uses, uh, actually I'm drinking it now. Uh, it, it's, it's a little bit hyper sweet, but it has monk fruit, electrolytes, and ketones. As of like a lot of the other products will use erythritol that doesn't settle well in my stomach or sucralose which is kind of like hyper sweet and then the main issue limitation with a lot of these ketone salts on the market are the electrolytes i drink it and it just goes right through me and you know i just go it gives you like pretty bad diarrhea or some other issues so it's really important to nail the electrolyte uh ratios and um and i think the tolerability will really enhance you know the absorption obviously of the the ketones so um yeah, and I would start, you know, um, 10, one packet would be 10 grams of beta hydroxybutyrate. That's about the threshold for starting to, uh, you'll feel it. And, and and the ketones also seem to be synergistic when it's mixed with caffeine. Not a lot. Like I think you can get keto start with or without caffeine, but it has maybe like the caffeine version, maybe 70 milligrams of caffeine. Like right. it's enough to feel it. Uh, but there's a couple publications out showing that, you know, ketones alone or caffeine alone, uh, and the two together, it's not added additive. It's actually like synergistic. Right. And then you could also, you could also mix the exogenous, the ketone salts with MCT and those two together can actually further elevate your ketones. And the MCT tends to delay gastric absorption. 
So it extends the pharmacokinetic profile, we say to the right or the area under the curve. So instead of a really rapid rise, you get more of a slow elevation. So if you have like a four hour event or six hour event, you wanna might mix the, the electrolyte, the keto start with an MCT. However, if you're doing like a quick one hour workout, like, you know, the ketone salt electrolytes would be uh, good to take. But these will help uh, with reaction time. Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, there's not a whole lot of things that people agree about as far as in the performance domain. Like I said, I think, I think these also need to be used as a training aid, but right. when given acutely, especially in the context of mental fatigue, or mm -hmm. training to exhaustion, then that will then increase like psychomotor vigilance, reaction time, decision okay. making, stuff like that. It's All right, nice. I'm, I'm going to need you to help me construct that. a study with this administration on reaction time because we have access to about fifty or sixty fighters here, and we actually could do this. Oh, the the challenge is awesome. the challenge is you know measuring reaction time with a reasonable, like we said, a, a coordinated peripheral motor response as opposed to yeah. a finger tap. But nevertheless, I'm working on that right now. But this would be wonderful to investigate. Yeah, yeah. There's also like there's different studies that I was in kind of our last. Uh, and there was, are you familiar with the incongruent flanker? Yes. I, I, yeah. 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 I think that, you know, it's looking at just cognitive processing and in that domain. Um, so I think and we did a lot of different tests. I'll have to look back to see like with NASA, we, would, we I was part of a space analog mission where we look at, uh, but they have a different program, the NASA TLX and also Joggle. Are you familiar with Joggle? Yep. Uh, yeah, we yeah. use that with Dr. Tarter, Tony. Yeah, oh, well, uh -huh. yeah my, my wife, this is her domain. She's a behavioral neuroscientist. Oh, so, okay. uh, so we'll like, we get the licenses for all them and we get like the iPad set up. And we actually do that like in a dry environment and then we do it like in an undersea environment where we have like wow. a dive a dive iPad where like you can wow. do the stuff, you can work on the <laughs> iPad underwater. Very cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, and look at, you know, in extreme environments. So, and and again, that's where being in a state of ketosis is neuroprotective and performance enhancing uh, in these extreme environments. And that's what kind of like, that's my career has been carved out just studying these extreme environments. But I think it has cross, you know, carryover effect to, to many, many other domains, right. like fighting. Yeah. Fighting is uh, about as extreme as you get, Tony. Yeah, so, uh, it, it can be. Yeah, all we got to do now is just do it in about thirty below zero, and then we can't get any more extreme. <laughs> um, hey, Don. In, yeah. in the interest of time, I think we're we're, we're close to uh, our time limit here. I wanted to address one last question in terms of any common questions or misconceptions about the ketogenic diet, because it's something that comes up a lot in social media. So, what would be the the common ones that that you need to debunk? Yeah, I, uh, good question. Uh, well, I, I get the question I get a lot, does the ketogenic diet work? Like, what do you mean <laughs> by work? It's so like context dependent, right? Uh, but I think I hear quite often that high fat diets are bad, right? And a ketogenic diet is a high fat diet. So uh, we work with different clinical organizations where ketogenic diets may really have a therapeutic effect or maybe a performance enhancing effect. Actually, the military, this is why they, they're they like, no, high fat diets are bad. Try to develop a ketogenic diet in a pill. So that sent me down the rabbit hole of developing exogenous ketones. And that's, I'm kind of like the reason they came to market, yeah. right? So, uh, so, but I was not of the opinion that high fat diets were bad. If they were bad, I mean, there's people on, you know, ketogenic diets for 30 years for inborn errors of metabolism, and they have perfect cardiovascular health and 80%, you know, fat diet. So I think high fat diets can be bad in the context of a Western diet where you're, where it's not a carbohydrate restricted ketogenic diet. Right. And of course, high fat diets are hyper palatable. And the, the big thing is that a higher fat diet can lead to more calories consumed and more weight gained over time. So it's more of a calorie, a, you know, an excess calorie thing or an energy toxicity thing. 
So if someone says high fat diets are bad, uh, I quickly sort of point them to the literature of ketogenic diets and their therapeutic effects and their emerging applications, which are tremendous, even like feels like metabolic psychiatry, for example, which was theme in a conference that we just held in Clearwater, the Metabolic Health Summit. I'm a co-host for that. We had a whole, you know, now there's like dozens of studies at major institutions studying ketogenic diets for bipolar, schizophrenia, depression, anxiety. This did not exist five years ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking about like NIH sponsored like research. So that's a very rapidly emerging area uh, that I'd also like to point people to because just to keep an eye on it. Uh, But yeah, I would say the big thing is that there's a stigma that high fat diets are bad and, but that's very context dependent in the context of carbohydrate restriction, and caloric, you know, temperance, I guess you would say, or keeping a eucaloric, uh, a eucaloric high fat diet in the form of a ketogenic diet is no worse than a eucaloric mixed diet uh, on health. So, and I think there's some remarkable potential benefits to that. So that's good to know, Tony, in case you embark on your ketogenic diet. Well, I did it for about (laughs) six months and it was kind of fun. I, I, you know, um, Cognitively, I did feel really good. I, I mean, uh, it was a little bit of a struggle um, from the peripheral side on the wrestling side, you know, a little burning there, like probably needed a little more glycogen downstairs, but brain felt really good. And yeah. to, to Dom's points earlier, by the way, my blood work was spectacular. My triglycerides, yeah. I was eating cream cheese and avocado for lunch and my, and my, my triglycerides were 38. 38. Wow. 38. Yeah. I mean, that's like a 95 pound female yoga. uh, (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. that's remarkable that you can like triple your fat intake, but your triglycerides are like cut in half. And that's that that really surprised me when I did the ketogenic diet. Actually, one of the the, uh, disturbing side effect or potential side effect of the ketogenic diet and people that are not adapting is that their triglycerides can dramatically increase. And that's basically showing like some kind of fatty acid oxidation uh, bottleneck, or maybe okay. uh, they might have a SNP for a fatty acid oxidation disorder. So that in that case, I would tell people not to do the ketogenic okay. diet. But so, you know, with, with wrestling and fighting and things like that, what I would say is that people really got to give it like two to three months yes, for you, you to ramp up those yeah. metabolic adaptations to actually even feel normal. I mean, when I started going to the gym and working out, I, my strength took a dip and I guess it was about two to three months. Did it come back up again where I felt like every, everything filled back out my muscle glycogen. So there was some adaptations there. Um, Jeff Volick is studying that and a few other people are studying it, but um, I think it's a very interesting, you know, field of research, these metabolic adaptations and metabolic flexibility. You know, I think you've probably had Mike T Nelson on, you know, he talks about metabolic flexibility a lot. Yeah. Mike's a great guy. He is. Well, Dom, tell uh, tell the audience where they can find you if you're going to be speaking at a conference. Anything coming up this year? Yeah. Uh, well, well, we just hosted the Metabolic Health Summit in in Clearwater, Florida. We had like seven six hundred and seventy people, I think, att- attend that. That was a growing conference. Uh, the Metabolic Link podcast is actually associated with that. Uh, it's ACCME approved uh, information, so you can get yeah. medical education credits with that. Uh, my website is ketonutrition.org. Uh, Ketone Technologies is the site that I have for consulting and scientific research. And uh, yeah, I have a I have a bunch of different conferences coming up. Uh, you know, and I I can't remember them all, but uh, <laughs> I, I have busy a man. Yeah, intense teaching schedule on top of conferences. But I do really believe that education outreach is super important and. Uh, I thank you for letting me be on your platform for talking about this topic. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's fantastic. And and by the way, I plan on 20, I'm already lobbying for this and I am on the board. So plan on 2025 coming over the outside of the state, potentially talking about ketogenic diet and athletic performance uh, and cognitive processing and reaction time. Joey, I think that'd be great at uh, I agree. Society for Neuro, Sport Neuroscience. Yep, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Love well, Tom. Hey, thank you so much for being on the Sports Science Dudes. This it's was awesome. been an hour of really informative and cool stuff. I've actually learned more in this hour about the ketogenic diet than I knew even prior. Because it's a yeah. category that's always confused me, but you've helped yeah. you'll, you'll help clear up 
some of the confusion. So we appreciate your time, Dom. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks for Dom. having me, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye.